uh, from Pakistan. Raza is a social scientist and an award-winning translator and a book critic. He has been trained in political economy from the University of Leeds in UK and in Middle Eastern history and anthropology from the University of Arkansas. Uh, he has engaged uh, with the Middle East uh, since last two decades now and widely traveled in and reported from Egypt, Yemen, and Turkey over the last decade or so. So very knowledgeable about the area and, and about the developments uh, which is happening in the region. Uh, Reza is uh, going to speak on uh, the rebirth of hope in Arabia Felix, um, Arab ja Jacobins. That's this first uh, um, part, of, part of the title. Uh, Reza, uh, would you like to take the floor and share your thoughts or presentation? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Ali. Uh, and thank you very much to the organizers of this conference for uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, talk about a quite a depressing topic, uh, to be very honest. Uh, as is much of the news from the Arab world in general and uh, dare I say the Muslim world in particular. And uh, uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation which I will share with you if you allow. Yes, uh, please. Uh, and uh, then we can take it from there. Uh, how do I do this? I have a presentation. How do I share it, please? You must have a share screen option. Yes, thank you, I have it, thank you, yes. Yeah. All right. Great, yeah, it is. Yes, is it we, can see your, we can see your, uh, your, your presentation now. So uh, yes. actually there was a question mark uh, at the end of Arab Jacobins, which somehow got eliminated uh, when I said, uh, you know, uh, by the time it reached the organizers and they, it was there for good reason, you know, because it was a question I was asking myself uh, when I was working uh, on this presentation and as I researched, and this is a question which I am also putting uh, to the audience. Uh, and uh, the subtitle of the presentation uh, is of course the rebirth of hope in Arabia Felix. And as anyone who knows anything about the Arab world, Arabia Felix uh, is the old Roman name for uh, this whole area, which we now call Yemen. And obviously it means happy Arabia in Latin, but the news from Yemen is hardly happy, uh, you know, unfortunately. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with some general remarks about uh, what has gone on in the Arab world, uh, more or less since the last decade. Uh, I mean, Arab Spring is certainly not the title I would use for these uprisings. I mean, journalists usually, uh, you know, have this habit of coining catchphrases, which uh, without any research. And, you know, these uh, catchphrases often go out of season. And of course, you know, after spring, we have autumn and we also have winter, you know, so uh, things can hardly remain the same. So as the citizens of the Arab world are now finding out. So this is not a phrase I prefer to describe events in the Arab world. And then I'm going to talk about the subject at hand, which is the tragedy, uh, which we now call Yemen. So uh, the 2011-2012 Arab uprisings, which have succeeded in toppling tyrants in Tunisia, Egypt, and Yemen, and a genuinely popular leader in Libya, this is my own contention, are still in a state of flux. It must be remembered also that this is not the first time that popular mobilizations have occurred in the Arab world. In the 1950s and 60s, beginning with Egypt, it was the nationalist military which emancipated the country from foreign domination, as well as local clients of the latter, while popular mobilizations happened later on from below. And the pattern was to be repeated across the Arab world. You know, you had popular military coups in Iraq, in Syria, in then North Yemen, and Libya, and given added impetus and support by the success of the Algerian resistance against the French uh, in 1962, and then a victory for the communists in South Yemen against the British five years later in 1967. So that was a tremendously hopeful period in, in, in Arab politics, you know. Uh, however, the key difference between the events of the 1950s and 60s and what is happening now in the Arab world as we meet is that in the latter case, it is the people who basically liberated themselves from 
this militarized model of a one party state which came to dominate the arab world since the last four decades and uh, in in my humble opinion the arab uprisings are more reminiscent of the revolutions of 1848 that struck fear in the hearts of every european monarch from the bourbons to the austro-hungarian empire this comparison is more apt in my opinion for example than the preferred comparison in the mainstream western media with the anti-communist uprisings of eastern europe in 1989 uh and the reason is that the 1848 revolts like the arab revolts occurred in long cycles or going over decades in the case of the former the longue durée from the time of the french revolution in 1789 to 1848 adopted liberty equality and fraternity as its slogans while in the latter case the period in arab history which inaugurated the uprisings of the 1950s came full circle with the arab spring uprisings so to speak uh, of 2011 also like the european counterparts the arab uprisings are also about liberty equality and fraternity or were about liberty equality and fraternity the arab masses want freedom from decades of oppressive dictatorship they wanted social and economic justice from the emissarizing policies of the world bank IMF and European Union imposed by these dictatorships and wanted so for all the arab people beyond national frontiers this last aspect uh, is exemplified by the rapidity and spontaneity with which the revolutionary infection spread from tiny tunisia to egypt and from egypt across the arab east even the gulf states were not spared uh so now from the from the general to the specific let me come to the case of yemen uh, which really has been under reported uh since the uprisings broke there in february 2011 exactly 10 years ago and uh, i mean what is going on in yemen is really a huge tragedy and uh, as you know what happened uh, last week in lebanon it only took a statement from the lebanese information minister for the entire gulf countries to rally around around saudi arabia and uh, really uh, these things tend to blank out the fact that at the moment as we speak the most the richest country in the arab world that is saudi arabia is bombing the poorest country in the arab world a neighbor which happens to be yemen so uh, like the european revolts of 1848 the first round of the arab spring went to the people and like the former the counter revolution was very quick to assert itself first in the shape of the imperialist invasion of libya uh, and then the brutal crushing of the, the uprising in bahrain and uh, of course uh, in syria there is continuing counter revolution because there are state actors many different states and non state actors they are all part of the mess which is right now in in syria so while the mainstream media and the west continues to take an interest in the fate of the arab uprisings in the larger states like tunisia i, I think uh, one of my fellow participants will be talking about tunisia next like egypt like syria and libya in at least two cases the reporting on the uprising and the oppression which has been inflicted against the protesters has totally vanished one of course is bahrain we, we hardly uh, we hardly hear anything about what has happened in bahrain and and the other case of course is the case of yemen uh, about which i'm going to talk about uh, in a moment so uh, of course uh, yemen as i mentioned uh, just a few minutes earlier is the poorest state in the arab world and it is un- sometimes very unfairly mentioned as the birthplace of al qaeda uh, the country until recently was ruled by a nasty dictator uh, called ali abdullah saleh who had been little more than a saudi american stooge in his entire tenure i mean he ruled yemen uh, for more than 30 years Uh, when protests spontaneously broke out in Yemen against Abdullah Saleh's regime in 2011 following the victorious uprising in Tunisia the dictator responded by brutally crushing the protest movement on one hand and dallying over handing power to a successor uh 
I think some historical background uh, will be necessary here because Yemen right now is, is there, there are many, many issues. Um, I mean, from mainstream media, it may be, uh, one may be forgiven for, uh, uh, for thinking that the only conflict in Yemen is a religious conflict, which actually it is not, you know, uh, between the Houthis who are in power in Sana'a and the, the government of Hadi, who the West and Americans back. But the situation is much more complex, you know. Uh, so Abdullah Saleh by 2011 had become so unpopular that Yemen quickly became the only Arab country where protests became a daily occurrence. However, most of the mainstream media whitewashed this history of the country to paint it as a land of beards, burqas, and tribes, and bombs. Uh, Yemen was two countries before its reunification in 1990. The North was ruled by the Ottoman Empire before the empire collapsed, giving way to a very medieval sort of an imamate, which ruled with an iron hand, claiming divine sanction, while the southern part of Yemen was a British colony. Uh, this began to change in the 1960s, because in both parts of Yemen, there were democratic uprisings, which attempted to overthrow the imam in the North and the British colonialism in the South, respectively in the 1940s and 1950s. Both the struggles bore fruit uh, in the shape of uh, first 1962 revolution in the North, when the Imam was overthrown by military officers who were impressed by Jamal Abdul Nasser, who, as you know, uh, was the Lord Star of the Arab world uh, in, the, in, 19, in the 1950s. Uh, so in 1960, and, and followed five years later by a very successful armed struggle by a Marxist group calling itself the, uh, you know, uh, later on became the Yemeni Socialist Party, the National Liberation Front, which took over the leadership of the nationalist struggle and threw out the British, proclaiming a Marxist Republic in the country. The only time in the history of the Arab world anywhere that a Marxist Republic had been proclaimed. The North soon descended into a tribalist republic. Uh, in the South, serious reforms were carried out like female emancipation. I think I, I just listened to Ali talking uh, to the Indonesian speaker about uh, female empowerment. So this was happening in the South of Yemen. Uh, you know, burqas were publicly burned in the streets of Aden, the capital of the South. There was land reform and free provision of health, education, and housing. However, as a result of uh, fractional, fractional struggles and partly as a result of Saudi interference, no serious alternative to the status quo took place in Yemen. And there was a hasty reunification of the country, so-called uh, brought about uh, with Saudi and American blessings to counter the plucky little godless people's republic in the South. And Ali Abdullah Saleh, who already was president of the north of Yemen, came along with this package deal. So he basically became the president of this whole unified country called Yemen. Uh, now, I basically was a graduate student in the United States in 2010. Uh, so I decided to visit Yemen uh, because I got really disturbed, by, like everybody else, reading frequent reports in the mainstream media about a massive Al-Qaeda presence in that country. Uh, and I had written before I visited Yemen uh, that, uh, you know, what is basically what the West is doing uh, about Yemen when it talks about Yemen, you know, the likes of Thomas Friedman in the New York Times or Shadi Hamid, uh, you know, they basically talk about Yemen as if Yemen actually has no history. You know, it's an ahistoric country and grossly generalized, generalized Yemen. Uh, and this image of Yemen, you know, has become and became a staple of mainstream media following the arrest of a Nigerian bomber who wanted to bomb a flight to Detroit and who had spent time in Yemen at, at the same time in 2010. So in May 2010, I got a chance to visit that country on the eve of the 20th anniversary of that country's reunification, And I was warned by many friends not to travel to the south due to security reasons, but I chose to disregard it and went to Aden which is the biggest, uh, you know, city in the South and the former capital of the People's Democratic Republic of South Yemen. And I actually was not prepared for what I saw upon my arrival. Uh, you know, this was a country where I mentioned just a few minutes earlier, women were publicly burning burqas in the streets of Aden, uh, 
and you know um, women were to be found in every walk of life when i went there uh, in 2010 there were hardly any women to be found on the streets except the ones in burkas and uh, i later on met some of the leaders of the yemeni socialist party this is the reincarnated uh, national liberation front of yemen which took power there in 1967 uh, about how this retreat actually happened you know from a place which was teeming with women who were leading from the front in every walk of life in the south and now you can hardly find find any women uh, except in the university so how did it come to pass and they confessed their helplessness to defending even their own legacy in the south in the face of saudi clerics which who were sent specially from across the border with the encouragement of the ex dictator solik in fact the situation in the south right now is that there is an openly secessionist mood because the un- reunification in 1990 which was much trumpeted was simply meant the importation of the north the northerners into the south and their subsequent takeover of the land property and colonial villas belonging to the southerners i mean the situation which practically existed here in united pakistan before uh, bangladesh became an independent country in 1971 i was reminded of that from my discussions with 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 the yemeni leaders so this is it's routinely routinely claimed that al qaeda uh, aqip has a presence in yemen and uh, you know i tried to find about that during my visit and this skepticism extends to the uprising against sole in the north and this uprising has not really addressed the plight of the south so far so i asked around uh, uh, about the al qaeda presence and i was told off very politely however when i persisted in my inquiry a deputy to the ysp leader beckoned me to come nearer and whispered in my ear i mean i could speak some broken arabic at that point so what i could understand i'm sharing with with you he said the office of al qaeda in yemen is located in a tiny building next to the presidential compound this is basically what my ears heard and i've written about this in other words the ex dictator abdullah saleh black mailed the west regarding al qaeda in return for money the al qaeda presence in the country is no more still no more than a few hundred people and it has been vastly exaggerated during the last days of solis dictatorship the army yemeni army deliberately laid down arms in many southern areas to let this exaggerated al qaeda presence capture whole towns to create an image of chaos i mean al qaeda is hardly the issue in yemen right now the, there are other issues but al qaeda is not one of them despite reneging on earlier promises to step down solis agreed to allow elections to be held in mid february 2012 to pave the way for a successor in return for immunity from prosecution for himself and his family this was the preferred saudi american solution to ensure that a real structural transformation does not take place in yemen and there is considerable distrust regarding both the saudi and american rules in destabilizing democracy in yemen on the streets of sana especially among the youth at the time of writing the islamist isla party constitutes the largest opposition party in yemen and if elections were to be held now i mean elections have actually not been held in yemen despite a lot of pious homilies they would win the maximum seats uh, just like uh, their counterparts in tunisia uh, the al nahda Uh, and of course egypt uh, the ikhwan al muslimun the elections uh, basically uh, in yemen did achieve little apart from electing an incumbent vice president as the country's next leader who we now call a president hadi of yemen i mean only one candidate was allowed in the presidential election and that was the person who is now occupying the presidential chair uh, uh, who is basically ruling from saudi arabia he is not even in charge of the whole country and his only claim to legitimacy is that he is supported by the americans the saudis and the so called international community so he is someone who has been part of the dictator saleh's country and he became president of the country after saleh's resignation now an interesting footnote to this uh, dismal situation in yemen was provided in late 2011 when the nobel peace prize recognized the efforts of one of yemen's leading protesters tawakkul karman and made her a co recipient of the nobel peace prize uh, 
And Tawakkal Kurman was the brave lady who protested every day in the public square in Sana, the Tahrir Square, refusing to leave and join her husband and children until Saleh resigned from power, which he basically did. And unfortunately, Tawakkal Kurman is actually now in Istanbul. Even conditions are so unsafe for a Nobel Peace Prize winner like Tawakkal Kurman to, to, be, to be in her native country. So the question is with the Yemen, uh, you know, the situation in Yemen is still in a state of flux. Uh, you know, 30 million people in Yemen, more than 20 million are at a serious, uh, you know, risk of, uh, you know, mass starvation. We only talk about Afghanistan, but the problem in Yemen precedes what, what's happening in Afghanistan. You know, uh, you know, uh, we did not have to contend with the coronavirus. Now there is coronavirus in Yemen. Uh, whoever uh, wins eventual power in Yemen as a result of 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 what of this process has an urgent task of healing the country. Since it is possible for Yemen to go the Bangladesh route, meaning that the South can still become an independent country. I mean, the Southerners only be, uh, are cooperating uh, with uh, Mr. Hadi. Uh, because uh, the, Hadi now claims that the bigger threat is against uh, against this powerful social movement, which actually captured uh, Sana, who known as the Ansarullah or the the Houthis. I mean, the Houthis are not terrorists, by the way. Uh, I mean, uh, thanks God, when Biden came to power in, uh, as president, the one of the first things he did as president was to to stop this designation, which Trump had designated the Houthis as a terrorist group. It's not a terrorist group, you know. I mean, you know, uh, you know, it is as much of a terrorist as Hezbollah is in Lebanon. And of course, Hezbollah is part of the parliamentary process in Lebanon. How can you label uh, a social movement which has broad-based support in Yemen as a terrorist group? You know, beggars belief. So as I have warned before, Yemen has a history of uprisings and revolutions, both in the North and South, and the agendas of both the Republican Revolution and the Socialist Revolution are still unfulfilled more than 60 years on. That is the only way the promise of unity can be realized, short of pandering to Saudi US plans of continuing with the protectorate status under Saudi. Protectorate of Saudi Arabia, you know, you know, as I speak, the country is under a state of siege. It is being bombed every day by Saudis. And when the Houthis retaliate by those missiles, it is claimed that the Saudis face a national security threat from the poorest country in the Arab world. I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, because the Saudis have got petrodollars and world public opinion on their side, the mainstream media totally kowtows to this, this belief, you know, that the Saudis actually uh, face uh, a national security threat from the poorest country in the Arab world. You know, I mean, um, um, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, has blood of thousands of innocent Yemenis on his hands. Uh, and in any decent court of law, he would be tried as a war criminal, you know. So, so Yemenis continue to suffer from the worst of every world. So concluding my presentation, the people of Yemen will not be content for a very long time, and it is this promise which gives hope that the country may not yet turn into another Saudi vassal state. Events in the Arab world, therefore, are in a state of flux, but what cannot be denied is the fact that the Arabs have a long and deep historical consciousness. They may be oppressed, they may be jailed, they may be beaten, tortured, and humiliated, but they will always eventually rise up against oppression and injustice. The Arab uprisings also prove that when one loses their fear of death, the people can work miracles with great dignity and courage. Uh, I would like to end my presentation with a beautiful uh, uh, you know, verse from the great Syrian poet Adonis, who is one of the greatest living uh, writers of Arabic and frequently mentioned as a possible Nobel prize winner for literature. I'm desperate to conclude on a hopeful note. And of course, we resort to poetry because poets cannot be bought. You know, uh, good poets flee into exile and they continue writing good poetry. Same is the case with Adonis. The poets carry the hopes of the people. So I quote Adonis, a time between ashes and roses is coming when everything shall be extinguished 
when everything shall begin end quote and on this pathetic note uh, i would like to conclude this otherwise very dismal story of 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 a country and a people which deserve better thank you very much for your, for your kind attention thank you so much uh, raza uh, thank you so much for sharing your well researched presentation uh, with us um, i'm sure there are many questions and comments uh, in, in our uh, in our colleagues which they will be referring to you i see um, amin want to ask something and um, amin would you like to say something and then we will yes. move on to the next presentation yes my question for raza you mentioned outside interference on many occasions by the usa and saudi arabia unless i missed it i never heard you mention the name of iran well uh, yes because uh, my sources uh, in yemen tell me that uh, this is a frequent refrain of the you know uh, i mean look uh, this conflict is not a sectarian conflict i i think i mentioned that the problem in yemen is not a sectarian conflict it becomes a sectarian conflict whenever saudi arabia intervenes in any part of the arab world it, you know in bahrain the conflict was about democracy they said no shia no no sunni we are bahrainis the minute saudis crossed from the bridge into bahrain it became a saudi con it became a sectarian conflict in pakistan we have suffered a lot from saudi intervention i'm not talking about pakistan here if similarly uh, you know wherever the saudis have interfered it's not a con iran is not a party to this conflict because the houthis are an independent social movement who do not even believe in 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 the imams of the iranians they are a zaidi minority who basically you know are a very peace loving in by the way the ex dictator of yemen saleh was also a zaidi the media will never tell you this you know he was also a zaidi and these houthis were allies of saleh before saleh turned on them you know if you look at the wikileaks uh, you know uh, wikileaks uh, you know expose of the deals with saleh did with houthis you know unashamedly so what i'm trying to tell you here is that contrary to the mainstream media the mainstream media hardly talks about these other issues of yemen yemenis are a very peaceful lot in sana zaidis and and sunnis offer prayers together in their mosques there is no conflict at all but the minute saudi arabia you know puts it dirty tentacles i mean so, so yemen is a neighbor for for god sake the minute the saudis interfere in, in any country it becomes a sectarian conflict it was not and it is not a sectarian the conflict in in yemen is about bread it is about national self determination it is about democracy yemen is the only genuine democracy in this whole peninsula ruled by amirs potentates imams kings what have you and the saudis have a genuine interest in snuffing out this wonderful country which has genuine democratic roots going back to the i mean yemen yemen is not bahrain it's not an arab island floating on oil and gas it's not a tribe with a flag you know it is a genuine country with a genuinely proud history of democracy but the saudis have always been at the forefront even when if you if you look at the at the war of the 1960s the saudis were at the forefront of restoring the imamate that regressive imamate which is a which was created so many problem for yemen in the first place so the problem is iran is not supporting the houthis the houthis basically they became frustrated with the pace of the democratic process because you know saleh you know resigned and he was replaced by another dictator so they right. just came down from the mountains and seized power without thank any you. outside interference and thank, they thank have you, support Raza. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Raza. I think you have uh, explained your view viewpoint very clearly.